So hi, welcome to our podcast today. Um, we're going to be talking about evidence and how to use evidence to support learning and development in earlier settings. So I'm going to introduce uh, myself and the guests today. So my name is Nicola Cherry and I'm an early years content specialist at the EEF. And we've got uh, Heidi Price, who is a CEO at the Ideal Federation here in Plymouth. We've also got Caroline Watts, who is a specialist teacher in communication and language. And finally, Louise Jackson, who is a fellow early years content specialist at the EEF. So welcome everybody. So um, let's start to really think about what evidence is and you know, how do we use evidence in early years settings to support our sort of immediate priorities. So I don't know, Heidi, have you got any thoughts? Well, um, what, what, what we found uh, following COVID was that uh, we, we had children who were showing signs of um, reduced speech and language and uh, the inability to be able to self-regulate their emotions in, but predominantly. And so we thought, what can we do? Uh, what can we find that will actually support um, our, our practitioners to develop those skills? Which is where we, look, we went to the internet to look for evidence-based research, which could actually help make a difference. Um, the way the EEF has set up uh, their website is really helpful because uh, they've got the early years toolkit which uh, actually lists lots of projects that have been um, quality assured and actually tell us as settings um, the impact of those uh, projects, how many months progress children might make and how expensive they are. So that was a really good starting point for us to be able to say, right, OK, so what, do you, what shall we do and what, what should we look at? Yeah, because they really help you make an informed choice, don't they? In relation yes. to the context of the setting that you're working in. So they are really helpful mm. in that. So um, Caroline and Heidi, you've spoken a bit about some of the priorities being communication, language and personal, social, emotional development. So how have you then sort of used evidence to sort of, sort of really sort of think about how you're going to address those priorities? What are the sort of things that you've been doing in your settings to support your, your staff and children? Um, well, what, what we did was we came up with a, a, a school improvement plan uh, and we, we, because of the variety of staff and the different um, kinds of staff we had, we wanted to make it accessible to everybody. So across the last uh, 18 months, we've been revisiting similar areas and building on that. Yes, yeah, so we've used a sort of spiral approach to development with the whole staff, taking everybody on a journey all together has been really key to make sure the practice is developed and everybody's engaged and involved in it, sort of a co-production approach where you introduce um, some core training initially and we've related it back to the evidence store and then you build on it when you revisit it next time and then build on it again when you revisit it again and again and again and you're sort of using a knowledge exchange system for development for everybody so you impart a bit of knowledge to the staff and then they try it out and practice they action it we come back together talk about how that's gone and then say excellent and then move on to it um, and, by developing it again. And then the other thing you've been doing is when you can see practice, okay, that's improved now, but actually yes. we now need to look at this. For example, we did a lot of work on how do we look at developing speech-language communication within the environment, on the, in the indoors, yes. and, and practitioners became really skilled at that, but then we noticed they weren't taking those skills to the outdoors. So, we, so then the training that Caroline did last time was all around what does it look like when we go outside. Yeah. Sort of using oh. and applying is really helping the using and applying yeah. of the knowledge has been the approach, and, really. And you've really focused on what the adults are doing mm -hmm. yes. in yes. terms of their interactions with children, yeah. as opposed to just focusing on what the children are, are learning at the time. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit more about what, what that training involved? Well, when I think adults? about um, what we, one of the things we thought about was what make, what's going to have the most impact, and mm -hmm. obviously, high quality interactions have yes. the highest impact mm -hmm. and we wanted to keep it really simple um, so we used the Shrek approach and um, we unpacked that it's very simple it's very accessible practitioners were able to understand straight away how they could use it and we were then able to uh, use that in the setting and then come back in staff meetings and talk about what have you noticed what difference is that mm -hmm. making uh, to the way children are reacting and responding um yeah, I was just going to add to that, and because we started with such a simple approach, it meant that everybody could see immediate impact and could see yes. the point. Yeah, it was very quick, wasn't it? Yeah. And then the other um, area that we've looked at has been, we've been working with the University of Bristol, which is one of the um, 
projects that is going is going to become a development project in September mm -hmm. through the EEF. And that has been around looking at an audit of five areas of communication mm -hmm. language development. And um, those areas look at what does your environment look like? What CPD training have you had for staff? How do you support parents? How do you actually have interventions with children? What kind of interventions are you putting in place? Mm -hmm. And what resources have you got? So you look at all of those areas. And then from that pro project, uh, that that uh, piece of work that you've done, you then create an action plan. And then that action plan is very bespoke to the setting. Mm -hmm. And you work as a team to develop the skills uh, and, and improve those areas. And have you been able to use some of the resources that the Education Endowment Foundation have produced? So, like the Early Years Toolkit and the Evidence yeah. Store. Because um, certainly the exemplification films are really focused on what the adult does and the yes. adult interactions and yeah. that was sort of the intention yeah. behind it. But I just wondered how you how you you've used those. I think the good thing about the, the good thing yeah. about the films is they're very short yeah. and mm -hmm. um, very accessible again, and so you, we can use them in staff meetings to let's have a look, let's do a little bit of theory. Uh, let's have a look at the video. What's the video showing us? Mm -hmm. And that video makes because people can see what something looks like. Then it means that they're... yeah, yes, and it and helps demystify it, doesn't it? So you see, ah, oh, that's mm -hmm. what I need to do. Or, yes. Oh, I'm doing that already. Yeah, it makes it so much easier. It it because it's so yeah, and we're setting yeah. some, someone else's setting. Yeah, seeing how it works. Mm -hmm. so. And going back to the evidence store in terms of communication language and thinking about that real intention, obviously there's a, there is a lot of intentionality, isn't there, around, yeah. you know, in terms of what specific um, strategies and practices um, we might use for children, you know, to help children communicate more effectively and improve their speech yeah. and language skills. Yeah. And obviously, um, Caroline, your area of expertise, we know that the evidence store helps to break that down in terms of it understanding does. the different components of communication language. Yeah. So, um, you know, you talked about demystifying and, and making, you know, trying to make the evidence store as accessible as we can to the sector, you know, recognising the different diversities in terms of experiences and qualifications. Yeah. Is there anything that you've been sort of doing to sort of help um, sort of, you know, educators and practitioners understand those sort of different components so in terms of like linguistic or in terms of like you know um oral comprehension um so you know i've noticed you know today in your setting how much set, uh, practitioners are using makaton and yeah. other visual symbols so i don't know if you can expand on any of the things i think it's just doing. about um sh having the chance to demonstrate mm -hmm. what the evidence store is already telling yeah. us in practice so lots of modelling alongside practitioners, working alongside practitioners within the setting, um, sort of peer-to-peer -peer support, so you know, sort of catching each other, doing, oh, that was a really great interaction, did you see the way so-and-so reacted? So, you know, all that kind of approach has been very helpful, and just helping people to realise the importance of that explicit teaching, particularly of language and vocabulary in our settings has been really mm. important because we recognised that that was an area our children were really struggling yeah. with post-COVID particularly. And mm. um, the other thing we did was we started off by asking all of our staff at every level to do a self-audit of themselves. They could keep it anonymous if they wanted, but just mm -hmm. to give, give us a gauge of where everybody felt they were in terms of their knowledge, but also in terms mm. of their confidence. And that confidence bit in particular was really helpful in helping us then do, um, create and deliver training that was bespoke and actually addressed everybody's needs and then when we did it again at the end and part way through we could see that mm -hmm. there was development the staff and their confidence most importantly was building as well so that they were feeling it's all very well finding out about new ways of working isn't it or slightly of adapting your practice but it's about having the confidence to be doing it consistently all the time because what we realized was that there initially there wasn't that consistency was no. that Heidi people had understood um, like the Shrek approach, understood the benefit of doing that, but because they didn't have the confidence, weren't necessarily using it consistently all the time, like not mm -hmm. outside, as you were saying, Heidi. So it was about building that confidence of the use and applying in every kind of context. And were you able to use some of your more experienced mm. practitioners to model it? We did. For others? You did. We okay. did. We actually built a communication because we were particularly focusing on communication language. We actually built a communication team, didn't we? Yeah. And we were right. very. Um, we were very certain right from the start we wanted to make sure we took um, 
practitioners from each part of the setting to be part of that team so that the whole of the setting was involved. Mm. And I think that really comes across as you move through the setting. Yeah. Because every practitioner is working consistently yeah. and interacting in consistent ways. Yes. So, so we've got um, a communication champion in mm -hmm. each of the settings. Uh, so, you know, their role is to make sure that the environment's looking the way we've mm -hmm. all agreed and that they're modelling excellent practice themselves and that they they're our advocate, really. Yeah. And regardless of who's in the setting, they're the one that's there who is actually making sure that things are, are working the way mm -hmm. we've all agreed that they'll work. And that seems to be working well. And, and yeah. rolling, this, rolling it out across the whole of the Stronger Practice Hub. Yes, yeah, so what is what happened is we've, we've been working with the University of Bristol for the mm -hmm. last uh, eight months mm -hmm. uh, with the project. The project has um, been researched through UCL as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we are then, we're at the developmental stage with the EEF and the project will then be taken to 10 to 12 settings, uh, so it'll be offered to 10 to 12, 12 settings through that the EF programme. Uh, and once we've gone through that process, we hope then we'd be able to take it up to more settings. But obviously we need to make right. sure that we get the evidence to support, uh, and it's really thorough to support uh, this to go at a, a wider scale. So this is you uh, really getting involved in evidence generation yeah. yes isn't it yeah and adding to that um, evidence bank within the evidence store yeah. in the early years toolkit yeah. um, so that's really interesting mm. are you rolling out any other programs with communication around yes we've got early talk boost okay um, uh, so we've got yes. about 70 settings i think that we've got that is available too um, and we've also got Chatterbugs coming along soon, yes. which will be another 25 settings, so that's speech yes. and language. So this is a real scale mm -hmm. of yeah. Yeah. projects that we know are um, evidence-based, Yes, yes. are going to have real impact. And we've got um, the Maths the Champions, maths champions, champions well. which mm -hmm. is coming out, uh, which is coming out now as well, so we've got 25 settings on Maths Champions mm -hmm. as well. I think one of the other reasons we found um, implementing the research and the guidance from the evidence store um, so helpful is that we've been able to dovetail it haven't we with what we already had in place as well yeah so we already had mm -hmm. practitioners for instance that were elk land trained so they were used to certain strategies that they'd learned through that or through doing the EYPDP as well um, and we were able to dovetail things like the Shrek approach into those yeah, that's the traffic, really like, interesting. Yes. So you're not throwing things out. That's right. We built upon them. Yeah. yeah, it's building on yeah. things and, and using the evidence to reflect on what you're already doing. Yes. Yeah. Building it up. That, yeah. that sounds a really good approach. Yeah. So Caroline, I'm going to just bring you back with your your specialist knowledge here. Um, so really thinking about that, you know, some studies have shown that in particular. Um, these communication language approaches have been beneficial for children mm -hmm. from sort of more vulnerable and back, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. So, what you know, what have you been sort of doing to sort of help um, ensure that those children's needs are being met? So, one of the things we did as a setting to really support those children in narrowing the gap was looking at the strategies that are evidenced within the evidence store and thinking about, okay, so how can we ensure that we're addressing these children from the, that are more disadvantaged in their language to really mm -hmm. help them begin mm -hmm. to catch up with their peers. And we recognised it was about really ensuring we were creating not just a language-rich environment, but an environment that was language-supportive so that everything that we were doing for all children was supporting all children mm -hmm. to progress and develop. So taking sort of a more um, adaptive approach to supporting the children because we recognise that not every child will pick up on language just pick it up naturally in those implicit mm -hmm. activities that we might put out where you might naturally um, pick up some new words. Some children needed that direct teaching, that explicit teaching of language and the opportunities to go back and revisit it and revisit it again and understand how it can vary in different contexts. So like if it was a concept word, understanding that, you know, a mouse is little compared to a dog, but actually a dog is little compared to a horse, mm -hmm. you know, so understanding yeah. what these words mean in a variety of contexts and different situations that some children have got a really good, strong foundation of language may be able to pick, on, mm -hmm. pick up quite quickly because they've already got a good grounding in yeah. their vocabulary understanding and in their word store. But for those children that had a shakier 
um, or uh, less uh, structured uh, word store, if you like, or bank of language to mm. fall back on and pin new learning on. It was about giving them the chance to really strengthen mm. their learning. Yeah. Is that and that might happen, yeah, for example, for children around the water tray yes. and the adult is, knows those children really mm. well and will target questions and develop yeah. the yes. different aspects of, of the children depending on what kind of language support those children need. Yeah. So it can be varied. It's not about yes. singling children out. No. It's, it's about just knowing knowing children, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. you're meeting those children where they are, whatever yes. they're doing, yes. the water tray, in the sand mm. outside. Yeah. Um, but if every adult knows how mm. to do that, mm. knows what to do, then they can have those interactions yeah. and conversations mm. with children and tailor it just to each child yeah. as an individual. So, yeah. yeah, it's been really exciting, you know, linking that to the themes as well. So yeah. that <laughs> families can be involved too, mm. because, you know, you get every, if you... You're talking about the vocabulary. So, for example, we were doing pirates the other week because Plymouth have a huge pirate festival mm -hmm. at the weekend. And so the children spent all week doing some wonderful things. All that language, very rich mm -hmm. environment, mm -hmm. that cultural capital we were giving them was going home to families. Mm -hmm. And they were, there was very, very much a sort of partnership going on. And then, of course, families could all go to the pirate weekend as well. So that was really lovely because that so was all for free. reinforcing <laughs> yeah. all that lovely vocabulary yeah. and using yeah. it at home as yeah. well. Yeah. Do you do anything with parents and training? Yes, yeah, so one of the things we did and one of the reasons why I think that some of the strategies that we were trying to develop with all the practitioners consistently was that we helped them come up with some top tips for supporting communication mm -hmm. based on all of the strategies we've been looking at together and trying out and embedding within our practice, which they did. Um, and then they shared them with the families. They actually had a parents' day and play day That's where they so came great. in. They shared yes. these tips mm -hmm. with the families, asked them what they felt, mm. um, and enabled the families to see these top tips in action, try them out at home and come back with their own comments mm. as well, which they were really receptive to and has made a big difference. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's I think that will make a really big difference. And obviously parental engagement is yes. in the early years toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that can be be used alongside mm. communication mm. and language strategies. Yeah. And well, there um, are other resorts, aren't they? Because if you think the children are with their parents a lot yeah. longer yes. than they're with nursery, so yeah. you know, if we can yes. upskill parents as well, then that's fantastic. And if you've had a really good response and, and, yeah. and different ways mm -hmm. of doing that mm -hmm. through these top mm -hmm. tips. or It's yeah. empowering parents. It's exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. And they can see it's not rocket science. Mm. Oh, you just need to get down on their level. Oh, I can do so that. that. Yes. Yes. yes, it's something yeah. you can do yeah. really easily. Yeah. Just simple, that's right. quick things. Exactly. Oh, I yes. just comment. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Mm. I think as well, you know, um, going back to uh, thinking about, you know, if parents with carers or, mm. or educators are particularly concerned about their child's speech and language, mm. then obviously they can always contact, um, you know, a, a specialist like yourself or, mm. you know, you know, get a referral to a speech and language uh, therapist for more specific advice. So mm. it's, it's like you said, there's using this resource and you know in terms of communication language approaches for all but also being aware then you know if they do need specialist advice they, yeah, they know where, where to, to get where to yeah. go yeah. so yeah it's yeah. really good but we're particularly focusing on outreach work through the stronger practice hub because um i think the important thing is that all practitioners know how to respond to children not just yes. we're waiting for monday when we know the speech and language yes. therapist yeah, comes in of course that's important but actually much more important is that everybody's professional um, engagement with children is at a certain standard Absolutely. so that yeah. everybody can be offering children yeah. all the time. Yeah. So it's much more empowering parents and carers, but also empowering our yeah. educators yeah. as well through these these um, evidence-based Yeah, and approaches. helping them to celebrate for themselves that they are absolutely key in these mm -hmm. children's mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it might confirm, like you said before, things that they know they're already doing, but equally there may be some yeah. things that, well, actually, I never, I thought that was something else, or I, I think I might need to, I want yeah. to work a bit more and know a bit more about a particular, you know, practice or, yeah. um, or a particular approach, so. Yeah, yeah, and I think we've really noticed going back into that sort of consistency, it's about, you know, knowing you can do that everywhere throughout your continuous provision, mm. it's not just about mm. doing it in one moment, like using and applying. Mm. Yes, so it's right across that yes. pedagogical mm. continuum. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Through every area of learning. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yes. Mm. And so with the Stronger Practice Hubs, I mean, obviously mm. we're here in Plymouth, yeah. and mm -hmm. it's fantastic. 
What about if you live somewhere else in the country? Are there other stronger well, practice hubs? Yes, there are, and everybody's got a region. So I think there mm -hmm. are 19 now across the country. Our region is quite large, um, and we're going right up to Dorset, Bournemouth, Christchurch, and Poole, but actually, mm -hmm. and right down as far as uh, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. But you know, we wow, are reaching out. It is a very big area. area. <laughs> but the thing is, we're reaching out through online in an online way because I mean, COVID right. has taught us a way of communicating, which has taken barriers away, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, last week we were in a meeting with um, Dorset, Bournemouth, um, and there were ninety people in the meeting. So you know, we we are able to get out. I'm in a meeting tonight with two groups, um, one in one area of the the region and another in another area of the region. Mm. So there will be there's there's an opportunity, even though we're in Plymouth, we're able to communicate mm. and reach mm. out. And of course, these EEF programs will run in particular areas. So mm. we try to divide out. You know, when we get given, you've got seventy spaces for early talk boost. We've divided those out ar around the locality so that everybody's got a fair access to to being involved mm. with them. Mm. So we are really taking on board the fact that we're really hopeful the government yeah. will give us more funding. But if they don't, we would like to make mm. the best use of the money as uh, in the biggest region as we can. Mm. How yeah. exciting for the sector, isn't it, that you know there is going to be um, this support available? So you know there's and it's accessible through you know different you know obviously the, you have the Stronger Practice Hub yeah. um, website. You've got your EF resources. Um, as well as other things that you'll be signposting yeah. within your local network. So, yeah, it's really yeah, it's exciting. It's a real opportunity for yeah. consistency. Yeah. It is. Yes. It is. And childminders, of course, are included. And absolutely. Yeah. And we've exemplified um, some childminders in our evidence store because we feel that's really important. Yeah. And it's been great to have their voice mm. and um, to, you know, show the work that they're doing yeah. within home-based settings. So that's they're, very, really they're really on board and yeah. very, very involved. They so. are. Mm. And again, we know, we can be confident that the training that we're signing up to access as practice practitioners is rooted in in, in that evidence mm -hmm. and that it will make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obviously we've talked a lot about um, practice and in action as such so you know we know that we've you know going back to our original point of using evidence to support learning and development mm -hmm. in earlier settings we always want to walk people back to that evidence and mm -hmm. to understand the why and the how. Um, and obviously, you know, when we look at the evidence behind some of these communication language approaches, there are some key findings that are really important. So we know that, you know, that there are great benefits to all children mm -hmm. around using these approaches, um, in particular for those children that are from disadvantaged or vulnerable backgrounds. We know that also in terms of the approaches that not one single approach on its own will maybe have the mm -hmm. greatest impact. So using multiple approaches yeah. is really, really important. I don't know if you would agree with that, Caroline. Yeah, definitely. That layering approach definitely is key, yeah. isn't it, to making change and helping. Mm. And going back, you know, as well to when you talked about confidence and your training that you've, you know, really carefully considered for your staff in, in using communication language approaches. Um, we know as well, don't we, that that's really important because the you know um, early as educators play such a vital and crucial role mm -hmm. role in identifying that early identification mm -hmm. of communication language um, difficulties. I mean, we've had children come into the setting with very little to no speech, but their parents may not be aware that that's actually not they're not at the right yeah. developmental stage because in their home, you know, they're they they've been the baby and they're 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 developing as they would expect. Um, so what we've seen as those children are now in the setting is the impact of the, the work that we're doing with them. They now can use some words, sometimes quite a lot of words. Um, we've had a child who came in who was who was very aggressive and um, had real difficulty self-regulating mm -hmm. and uh, hitting and spitting, which is obviously very antisocial behaviour. Uh, but we've been able to work with that child and he is now able to start using words and communicate effectively. So you've just got to remember that every kind of action is a form of communication mm -hmm. and that we just need to develop the speech side of things so that children can feel that they can get their point across effectively. Yeah, and that's why that identification of need is so important yeah. because you can then start from where the child is at and build on. So it's about, you know, helping practitioners to realise it's not just, it actually goes beyond interacting. What we really need practitioners to do is to be what I would describe as interthinking, so that you're really on the same level as this child, because that's how you can help that child progress and develop in whatever their area of need is. I think that's really interesting, that interthinking, that yeah. thinking process. And I think whilst we've been doing filming for the mm. evidence store, we've really seen that of... of 
adults who are having to think on their feet yes. as they're working with children yeah. and responding to children in the moment. Yeah, so. well, it really does for that sort of adaptive approach, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And it, I'm just wondering, you know, all the work that you've done in terms of that training mm. and you're beginning to see yeah. how it's mm. impacting on individual children. Yeah. Are there any other examples you've got where um, children have have maybe changed or you've seen a change because yeah. of what you're doing? Yeah, so we had another child in one of our other settings as well who, when they first arrived, had very, very little expressive language. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the impact it had was not um, on antisocial behaviour, but he was very, very anxious. Mm -hmm. Found it very difficult to separate mm -hmm. from his family. Found it very difficult to settle to anything. He could that he developed a really strong rapport with a particular adult in the nursery, and then found it very difficult to cope when that person had to leave the room or wasn't there mm -hmm. that particular session. He found it very difficult to cope with the routine initially because he needed to, he couldn't he had ec excellent thinking skills but he couldn't mm -hmm. communicate them. So once we were able to identify what was going on for him and support him, he began to build up relationships with everybody, develop his confidence. The staff felt confident in working with him. They were supporting his communication through so using signing and other visual support. And then his language began to develop over time. He just needed that real explicit teaching and direct uh -huh. learning of language and vocabulary to really help him embed those skills to enable him to have his own voice really and now he's talking away yeah there's a few little speech sound clarity issues but the anxiety has gone because he can self-advocate he can communicate mm. wow that's yeah. really good to hear mm. isn't it? Mm. how the impact of of that training and then on a on a child like that. yeah and i'm sure people listening will will you know, link with that and connect with that because they will know yeah. children yeah. who are exactly in that situation and need that kind of yeah. support. And we could feel confident that the, the strategies we were putting in place were the right strategies to use mm -hmm. because they were all evidenced in the evidence store. You know, that idea about having sort of, you know, when you're working with your language that you're not asking too many questions, you make sure you give enough time for processing mm -hmm. when you ask, if you do ask a question or you do... Um, relay a piece of information and that you make sure that you're um, you know, prompting and encouraging rather mm -hmm. than talking all the time. <laughs> yes. These are all specific practices that you can yes. see exemplified in the evidence. Absolutely. So, you know, you can really look and see exactly what does that look like. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, you know, we know that the evidence is continually evolving and yeah. you know that, for example, in interactive reading, that we know that, all, you know, the practices that are involved are, are having um, a, an impact um, and but we're not quite sure because it's such it's so complex and like you said that yeah. you know so highly skilled actually that actually it's difficult um, for researchers to actually pinpoint which practices are having the most impact so mm -hmm. we still know yeah. that there's work to do in terms of further research out absolutely yeah. in this in this area so um, and it's important to talk to to educators and practitioners about that but you know mm -hmm. there's still lots of work to do around finding you know generating more research in this area yeah and i think that's because as you were saying the early years educators are so good at using that layered Absolutely. approach and adap adapting yeah. to the situation and going from where the child's at and following their lead yeah. they're so skilled at taking that as their yes. starting point and some practices are very explicit yes. and some practices are more implicit yeah. and again in the evidence so we try and pull out and tease mm -hmm. that and, and try to you know really sort of show what practices are yeah. so, sort of naturally done and and you know are, are so sort of fluent and, and whereas more sort of you know more explicit practices might have more intention for specific needs or for specific Absolutely. purposes so yeah and the early years years toolkit the fact that it gives you that information about how much the project will cost yes. and also the impact in how many months progress you're likely to see for a child from a from a person who's is an overview of several settings mm. that's really helpful to know mm. that you know how much is it going to cost what resources i'm going to need for and, and how can I roll it out to several settings at the same time and really make a difference to all of them? Um, obviously, with the Stronger Practice Hub, we're, we're working collaboratively with other settings to support them in, in any of the projects that they're, they're running so that we've got networking groups running alongside what they're doing so that they're able to um, have the opportunity to talk to people and share experiences and and think about how they're going to develop and, and go forward. So yeah. really providing those opportunities for professional conversations within your yeah. networks. And as you know, you know that's really important yeah. For, yeah. for us in, in our sector. 
And I suppose, um, Heidi, as well, it's like, you know, if there are any sort of top tips or any, you know, final bits of advice that you might give, um, you know, educators or leaders um, in settings about how to use evidence effectively? I think the first thing I'd say is try and keep everything as simple as you can. You know, don't try and do too much. Uh, use the evidence uh store as an as a starting point to, to think about what shall you work on mm -hmm. think the most important thing is to make sure that you get high quality interactions between practitioners and children once that uh, is embedded then you can start building and developing subject knowledge um, and, and make sure that everybody you bring everybody along with you you know and because nothing changes yeah. until everybody's practice changes yes yeah. so. it's the only way to ensure you get that continuation of that practice yeah. as well isn't it for a long time mm. so if i was working in a setting in an early year setting that hadn't really used evidence didn't really know where to start mm. what would you where should i go what should i do well i think you can contact your local uh, stronger practice hub mm -hmm. who should be able to direct you to what programs they're being able to offer and those programs are fully funded so they don't mm -hmm. have to there's no outlay from your side um also, you've got your experts and mentors in your local area who are linked in. So, again, they're really able to come along, work, work alongside mm -hmm. you. If you want to particularly focus on one particular area, they can come and support you with that. Um, and I would say try and get involved with the professional learning communities that are in your area. And I'd say don't be afraid of the evidence. So, you know, go and have a look at those little videos. I mean, those videos that are there that are attached to the evidence are so useful because they're really good um, starting point for mm -hmm. seeing in action so what the evidence is that yes, for everybody. And then look, yeah, so they're accessible, so accessible, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really useful. And I think we've all talked about going under the surface, isn't it? Of, you know, and, and actually pulling out key findings. And I think one of the really lovely points that you made today in this podcast is around always making sure that when you're using evidence, you know, evidence doesn't tell us exactly what to do all the time, but no. we have to use it um, alongside our own professional expertise yes. yes I think when you're using evidence as well to really consider your own individual context and I think you you spoke about that a, a lot I mean in your own um, experiences but I think it's really important for people mm. to to sort of take away mm. yeah definitely because you can only use and apply when you're confident mm. well thank you very much um thank you, yeah, thank you for thank you. the podcast <laughs> and we hope that you've enjoyed uh, the podcast today and find it useful so thank you